launched on the gridiron in September. Perfected in the magic of March. For the fans who love the crunch of the pads, prefer a dunk and expect nothing but the best. It's Bigger Ten. Here's Steve Dace. Greetings. Welcome to this week's episode of Bigger Ten. I am Steve Dace alongside the one and only Aaron McIntyre. Good to see you, brother. How are you? Doing well. Doing very well. NFL teams put the pads on today. Been enjoying watching those videos on Twitter all morning. Uh, Hall of Fame game is tomorrow at the time we're taping this. Fall camps opening throughout the Big Ten as we speak. Uh, I think Friday by then, every school will be uh, immersed in fall camp. And and that's where I thought we would have some fun with this week's episode. If we played a little game called Fake News or Not, okay? Because even though a lot of it basically is sort of a glorified sports information director's take on a team, in the last few years, Jerry DiNardo's got a little uh, a little rebellious. He's been more willing to air some provocative opinions. But it's still great TV. And it, for a lot of us, it's the first chance we get every year to truly see our football teams uh, in the uh, what, they, what they have for the fall. And, of course, I'm speaking about the Big Ten Network's perennial camp tour throughout every Big Ten football team's training camp. That'll be starting up here about a week or two. And so what I thought would be fun for our big five on Bigger 10, Aaron, is I'm going to pick the five tropes that I'm very confident we are going to hear from the BTN crew of Howard Griffith, Jerry DiNardo, and Dave Revson. And I'm going to explain why I picked this one. And then you're going to tell me if you think that's fake news or not. Do you think there's some merit to it? Or is it BTN spin? You ready to go? Absolutely. All right, let's 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 start with our first team we're going to look at, Indiana. And the reason why this one is first is I wanted to give myself a layup to get started. I think it's a, more, it's a metaphysical lock, certitude. They are going to say this is the best team they've ever seen at Indiana. And remember, they didn't get to see camp last year when Indiana spent much of the season ranked in the top 10 because everything was shut down, right? So I think given what Indiana has coming back, they're going to say this is absolutely the best team they've ever seen at Indiana. I think this is true news. It's real news. And I think specifically what we're going to hear a lot of and what I have been hearing a lot of is the depth that Indiana possesses that they've really not had in the modern era of the Big Ten so far. That's what I'm hearing over and over again and, and, and reading over and over again with, with Indiana, particularly at this point in time with the defense. Now, I, I, I understand that the, the two deep that they released a couple of weeks ago, I think ahead of Big Ten media days, uh, it, it's got some names on there um, that... Uh, uh, we're not involved with spring practice. So I think this time of the year, the defense is always going to be ahead of the offense. So I think particularly on defense where they've got some more depth, particularly along the line, I think that's really what's going to stand out to the BTN bus crew. And I think that's what you're going to hear a lot of. Not just that this is the best team, but it's the, the deepest team that Indiana has enjoyed in quite a while. Okay, number two. And you know, Northwestern is most favored nation according to the Big Ten Network, Okay. I think they're going to tell us that Wisconsin, Iowa, and Northwestern are all fairly close as the best team in the West Division, and whoever gets the best quarterback play will win. And of course, each of these three schools, whether it's Graham Mertz, who teased us and then had COVID and then never really recovered last year at Wisconsin, Iowa looks like it's it's hoping to move on uh, if someone else can step into that position. And then Ryan Holinsky, the South Carolina transfer, the, the Clemson transfer didn't work. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the transfer from Indiana, Peyton Ramsey, did big time for Northwestern. They're going to try the transfer quarterback route again. Uh, this one from the state of South Carolina again. So I think they're going to kind of cop out and say these three teams are somewhat even. So it really just comes down to who gets the best quarterback play. So I'm going to say this is uh, fake news based virtually on one leg there. I, I think Northwestern is due for a little bit of a, of a step back this year. I think I think that's what we're going to hear a, a little bit, at least from, from the BTN camp crew, pumping the brakes a little bit. Again, offense has always been a little bit of their uh, 
let's just call it a heel. And so I'm, I've still got some questions on offense as far as they've con- uh, as far as they are concerned on defense as well. Um, you know, Pat Fitzgerald is always going to have a competent unit, but I just think you've got to play some. You've got to have some offensive threat as well. And I'm not sure that Northwestern has that. I think I think actually, I, I, despite the fact despite the fact that my Hawkeyes are in everybody's preseason top 20, 25 ranks. Um, I, I, I seem to see, I, I seem to sense quite a bit of trepidation purely based on who's going to show up at quarterback. Now, if Spencer Petrus can take a step cor- forward, I think they have as, uh, as good of a team as anybody in the West. I think actually that Iowa is going to surprise them a little bit. I think Wisconsin, what we're going to get out of the BTN bus cr- tour is this looks like another Wisconsin team, which means they're probably going to win that division. All right, number three. I think the BTN, again, I'm predicting what I think the Big Ten Network is going to say. These aren't my predictions, okay? I think the BTN crew is going to tell us, particularly with the youth at quarterback at Ohio State, and now you've got the 2022 top recruit, Quinn Ewers, coming into school a year early to really fill a quarterback room that they still hadn't even sifted through yet of all these highly recruited guys in the era of the transfer portal. And I think they're going to say, because Penn State knows who its guy is and Sean Clifford, and he may not be great, but he's at least something that steady and knowing that they're going to say Penn State has closed the gap on Ohio State in the East. I think this is true news only because it's Penn State. And they're the other the other big boy in the block in the uh, in the Big Ten East. Now, closing the gap could mean anything. I mean, I walk an inch forward, I've closed the gap between me and Mount <laughs> Everest, you know. Um, I'm, I'm, nice. That's that's just hyperbole, but uh, you, you get what I'm saying there. I, I don't comparing think... Ohio State football to Mount Everest in this league, brother, it ain't True. hyperbole right now, unfortunately. True. So I, I'm just not saying Penn State is necessarily that far back. But uh, goodness gracious, you can't go, especially in that division, you can't go around saying, wow, Penn State looks really good, but they're never going to beat Ohio State. you got to figure out a way to massage that a little bit. So Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're – I don't think they're going to say that about Michigan, although I'd like to be surprised. I don't think they can say that about Michigan. I don't think they have the balls to say that about Indiana. So I think the only team left then to say, hey, this could be uh, you know, them and Ohio State in the same sentence, I think that's Penn State for you. All right, fourth – I think the BTN crew is going to tell us this is the best team that they have seen Scott Frost have at Nebraska. (sighs) Wasn't it two, three years ago where they really started pumping the brakes on Nebraska? Mm -hmm. So I don't think they're afraid. It was the year after they they beat Michigan State at the end of the year, Frost first season. Yeah. And everybody, they were the preseason pick in 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 the Big Ten West by the media to win the division was Nebraska. Yeah, that's right. That seems like a long time ago. I, I don't think they have. I, I don't think BTN Network and really by extension, the Big Ten front on office. I, I really don't think they have a problem being brutally honest about Nebraska. I, I, this might very well be Scott Frost's best team. What is their preseason over under win total? Is it five and a half or six it's, and a half? It's six was the last I six. saw. So right there in that neighborhood. Yeah. So by virtue of that, it might be his best team. Um I, I, I think they might say it's an improved team. I don't know if they're going to say it's his best team. So I'm going to say fake news on that one. And number five, you ready for this? I think the Big Ten Network crew is going to tell us that they don't think there's a single team in the league incapable of reaching bowl eligibility. When you look at the progress Rutgers made last year, they lead the league in returning production, according to Bill Conley. Um, you look at Illinois bringing in a coach with a a very successful track record in our league and a returning starting quarterback. And I think they have more super seniors returning than any team in any school in the Big Ten does. And those are kind of considered your, you know, everybody's bottom feeders in the league, right? So I think they're going to say that with a couple of breaks here or there, they don't see any team in the league that's kind of like a 2-10 and kind of a squad. I think... When you are, as you set up this conversation, a glorified ADs or SID office uh, for the entire Big Ten, if it's even close, if it's even close. Like Ty always goes two, to the runner, man. Yeah, if it's even, you're leaving. <laughs> uh, if it's even close that all of the teams could could reach bull eligibility, you're pimping the heck out of that. 
if you're the Big Ten Network, really the Big Ten front office. So yeah, I think that's I think that's more of a lock actually than your first one about Indiana. Yeah, I don't, I think I might even agree. In fact, didn't I say something similar to that? I think yeah. about it here on the show here a few weeks ago. But I mean, is it is it really a stretch that you know Rutgers took basically this exact Michigan team in terms of personnel to triple overtime? Right? Would, would you be shocked if Rutgers beat Michigan? Would you be shocked? Shocked? No. I mean, I'm a Michigan fan. I'd not be. I wouldn't I, predict it. I wouldn't bet it. But I wouldn't be shocked. I'm not trying to be obtuse. I still would be, though. You still would be? Okay. Yeah. I mean, Illinois, with with a 60 year quarterback that has already taken taken them to a bowl game, and Brett Bielema's track record, would you be shocked if they won six games? In that case, not necessarily. Okay. No. No. So Rutgers is still at a different level of suck from your perspective. Exactly. See, I think they might be at a different level of suck of everybody else, but not the same level of suck they were before, so they don't suck as much. Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Dante's Inferno of suck. Yes, there's Which different ring, yeah. rings of suck. Yes, indeed. Well, they were in the final ring until Greg Schiano arrived. Who knows what ring they're at now? It's just not as warm there as it used to be. All right, we'll come back, play our weekly game of Big Ten Would You Rather here on Bigger Ten next. All right, let's get it going. It's this week's game of Would You Rather here on Bigger 10. And Aaron, I will begin with a Would You Rather for you. Would you rather the Big 10 not expand beyond those AAU, that's Association of uh, Academic Universities. I think that's what it's called. Uh, would you would you pr- prefer the Big 10 not ex- expand beyond AAU members to maintain some academic standards or just go get the best football brands that are currently available? I don't care about standards. <laughs> Have you seen me recently? Uh, no, I, I'm a I'm a football fan. I didn't actually attend the University of Iowa. Uh, I, I you're a tavern hawk. I am a tavern hawk. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't care I'm less. I'm a Walmart about, Wolverine, so I feel you. I could not care less about uh, academic standards. So call let's call up uh, B, uh, T Boone Pickens State down there in Stillwater. Yeah, and this is say let's roll. Is that what you're saying? Is, strictly, that, is that what you're thinking? Strictly for me as a fan. Now as an analyst, yeah, I mean these the. A lot of the guys, the vast majority of the players on all of these teams are never going to make it to the next level. So, you know, you want to give them the best, the best for, you know, risking life and limb, playing football, playing the sport, this collision sport. You want to give them as as much of a return on that investment of their body as as you possibly can. So a good education is is part of that. But as a fan... You know, I, I don't really care about the AAU. Let's call up Huggy Bear. Let's have him on a stool on the yeah, sidelines. Yeah, yeah. Next Big Ten basketball season, right? That would, Another Hall of Fame coach. Have West Virginia go into battle against Penn State and Ohio State right there in that neck of the woods, right? That'd be fine with me. That'd okay. be fine with me. I'd, right. I'd be glad. Actually, Mizzou is is AAU. I'd be I'd be fine with Mizzou as well. All right. At least, you know what? At least you own the fact you are standardless. I respect that. This one is for you. Would you rather have questions at quarterback or offensive line? Hmm. I, I'm I, I'm going to say offensive line. It's close, but you know Clemson doesn't put a lot of guys in uh, you know on Sundays playing the offensive line, but they have given us Deshaun Watson and Trevor Lawrence, right? So I kind of think, and I think maybe you know watching every game Matthew Stafford played for my Detroit Lions for the last twelve years maybe reinforces this. That there, it's easier with a great quarterback to game plan around a subpar offensive line. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in terms of quick strikes, quick hits, things of that nature. So, and and quarterback is still, I think, the most important position in all of American team sports. So, I would, I would. And the only thing that gave me hesitation is, you know, at Michigan we had Denard Robinson for several years, and our offensive lines were not that great, except for one of the years he played there, they were really good. But the other three years he was there, they were just so so at best. And and you saw what happened when other teams could match up up front against Michigan, and all of a sudden, when you can't get to the first level, you know, without facing uh, you know obstruction, you don't get to use shoelace. Shoelace doesn't get to use that speed he got to use against Bowling Green, right? So that's the only thing that gives me pause. But in general, quarterbacks the most important position in sports, including this sport, obviously. All right, for you, would you rather have a golden ticket to watch fall camp? at your favorite school or the school whose program provides the most intrigue? 
I would I would really actually like to have a golden ticket. To, I, I think Iowa, to me anyway, provides a lot of intrigue because we just don't know. We've got questions at quarterback going to my posit for you, uh, but I would really like to see what Michigan's fall camp is like. If things have truly changed up there, if this is actually a legitimate chance to have a, a good season this year for them, or whether it is just drain circling as it seems to be from the outside looking in. Did you, I thought you would like this question. What did you think? Did you like it? Yeah. No, that was that was super good. What, what would you choose? I... <sighs> I'd probably always go with my favorite team because I just have the most interest, whether they have the most intrigue or not. But I agree with you that it just so happens that my favorite team probably does have the most intrigue. I was going to ask you. Yeah. Yeah. If it's not Michigan, who else has the most intrigue? Nebraska, maybe. Yeah. Uh, would be there. I- I'm not so sure Ohio State's not there now. I mean, we've not had a quarterback room in our league like this, like ever. And, you know, you think back, there was a point in time that the the Miami Hurricanes had uh, a freshman Vinny Testaverde, uh, Jim Kelly, and Bernie, Bernie Kosar in the quarterback room at the same time. Okay, uh, so it's it's rare to have a quarterback room like this anywhere, and I don't think you'll ever see it again in today's transfer portal. In fact, I don't think you're going to see it at Ohio State for the next in the next few months. Mm-hmm. I think at least two of these guys are. Uh, if I'm not starting, I'm departing, and I'll see you uh, on the flip side. So, but but given the fact none of them are an established starter, none of them have ever completed a pass in college football. C.J. Stroud played last year, never threw a pass. So no one walks in on that, walks into this with some kind of like major league seniority, right? Okay, and and it's a it's this is a balancing act for Ryan Day, because. Kyle McCord is not as highly rated of a recruit as Quinn Ewers, but he is one of the highest rated quarterbacks in his class. You know what I'm saying? Right. So you got to think with Ewers coming early, you're not keeping both him and McCord. One of them's going, right? Especially when Ewers tells you the reason he's coming now is to cash some NIL money, yo. Well, that, is the NIL money better or worse if you're riding the pine? What do you think, right? <laughs> so I would be, and, and this is after Ryan Day talked about spreading the wealth of NIL money. Yikes. At Big Ten Media Days, there, there's some intrigue in how Ohio State's going to navigate that. You can have too much of a good thing with that many guys. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I still think in the end, Michigan, because of what's at stake there in the state of the program, is is the most intriguing with Nebraska a close second. This final one is for you, not necessarily Big Ten related, but tangentially maybe a little bit. Would you rather be the commissioner of the Big 12 or the American Athletic Conference right now? <laughs> in other words, would you rather be you knowing you don't really have a home right now in a few years yeah. or have ESPN in your corner? Um, full disclosure, I have known or covered the commissioner of the Big 12 Conference for like 20 years. Uh, and so... Um, I still think I'd rather have the Big 12 commissionership because there are still power schools there that collectively bring more value to the table than anything in the AAC does. Yep. So you may not have a, 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 the leverage you want to force a, a true partnership with the Pac-12 or um, get some of your schools into the Big 10 but you certainly bring more to the table still to the AAC. And so if you did have to do a deal where you combine those conferences, you come in there with a more valuable asset, right? So I think I'd, I think I'd still rather be Bob Bowlesby than Mike Oresco. But that, that, that's a good question, brother. No question about it. All right, we'll come back. This week's Twitter poll results, plus our feedback of the week is next. This week's Twitter poll results, we asked you who is most likely to be Big Ten Coach of the Year after a disappointing 2020 and lapping the field is James Franklin at Penn State, 54.5%. Jim Harbaugh was next at 20.4%, followed by Jeff Brom at Purdue and Scott Frost at Nebraska bringing up the rear. Your thoughts on these results? For a guy that's going to leave and take the job at USC, he's apparently, uh, according to me and and the plurality of our Twitter following, he's due to be (laughs) Big Ten Coach of the Year just by virtue of the company that he's in there, uh, right there. Um, This will be... I've got this really weird feeling about Penn State this year. 
Um, yes, they're going to say on BTN bus tour that they've closed the gap on Ohio State. I have this eerie feeling about Penn State that they might be in for a very subpar season. I'm not sure we've had they ha they've had a lot of attrition over the past couple of years and somewhat disappointing last year, but again, it was a COVID year. That's just a mulligan for everybody. Um, I, I'm not so sure about Penn State this year. It could be a really like a, an above, just barely above average team. Penn's, uh, James Franklin says, thanks y'all. I'm going to Southern Cal. Uh, see you in the Rose Bowl. I'm going to take my talents to SoCal. Exactly. Or <laughs> I, I could see Penn State in for a, uh, a disappointment. What that looks like, I, I don't think, I don't really know what their floor is. I think maybe their floor is four or five wins if I run a really bad season, which for Penn State, that's a really bad season. Uh, but I've got this weird, weird feeling about Penn State this year. It seems to me, which is odd because, you know, my uh, Michigan fans, this is the least amount of expectations going into a season, I think, since before Bo arrived, mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. And you're going back 50 plus years for that. I get the sense that you think there is market value in Michigan just because of the, the amount of dunk on that at some point I sense you believe oh, yeah. the way they have recruited, if those guys have any pride at all, if they have any desire at all to still play for Jim Harbaugh, that there might actually be a buy sign on Michigan given the amount of public dunk on. Do I, do I, is that what I sense Correct. from you? And I've said, I think I've said as much maybe on this, or maybe it's been off the air. I can't remember, but I, I've said as much before. Um, you know, they still recruit at a fairly high clip over in Ann Arbor. Those dudes are talented. Those dudes are talented. They can't all be overrated by the recruiting services. The dudes they have on that roster are talented. So I think if you've been, if you're an 18 to 23 year old young man and you keep getting dunked on and dunked on and dunked on, at some point you're going to say, no, no, I'm not five foot five. I'm going to pretend to be like the Yao Ming that I am right now. Um, and, and, and play up to your potential. I, I think if that happens, it's going to be because of the players this year and not necessarily because of the coaching staff, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So that's that's what I think anyway. All right, let's get to the feedback of the week. Chop says, hey, you left Greg Schiano off your list. Well, first of all, Greg Schiano did not have a disappointing 2020, right? No. I mean, did they exceed everybody's expectations? So... Um, I, I, Remember, the question was, after a disappointing 2020, which of these coaches do you think would have the best chance to be Big Ten Coach of the Year and have a big rebound in 2021? I mean, Rutgers and Greg Schiano had, had about as good of a first season as you could have possibly asked for, given the, the condition of that program when he took over. So um, not putting Greg on that list was actually a show of respect, not the other way around. No, I, and I, I'm, I'm really... I mean, this is maybe a testament to how much this channel has grown. Another country heard from. We heard from the Rutgers fan base. Chop nighttime with a picture of Greg Schiano in the uh, in the avatar there. That's, yeah. That's pretty cool. Dude, so. they made their first NCAA tournament since 1991. They brought back the by far the greatest coach the school's ever had and had a respectable year in year one. Um they should be, you know, uh, doing a little bit of chipping and chopping over there right now in, in Piscataway. No doubt about it. Oh, for, for definitely sure. I mean, that's that seems odd to say, but um, yeah, I think they've got it going about as good as they could right now. And I'm not trying to say that as a as a slanted or a faint praise right there. Before we get out of here, Steve, I got a question for you. We we talk about um, Big Ten football and collegiate athletics to some degree on this uh, channel, so we'd be remiss not saying something about any of the updates, if there have been any real ones, about college football realignment. The latest rumblings that uh, kind of started developing yesterday as we're taping this, which would be Tuesday the 3rd, is that the Big 12 and the Pac-12 are in cahoots, not cahoots, conversations with each other about potentially merging or something along those lines what do you think about that and as it stands today has anything really changed from the analysis you gave on this channel last week i think from a big 10 perspective that is that is an event you would like to see materialize because here here's the no man's land the big 10 is in 
it knows it needs to do something or something needs to be done to avoid slipping into a second-tier conference behind the SEC. It knows this. But what are your options, right? I mean, Notre Dame announced today its opener against Tol- its home opener against Toledo is going to be on Peacock, the stream service. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the I think that is not only a wave of the future we're going to see with streaming services, but Notre Dame coming out of the box with that for its very first home game is almost a is almost a, just to remind everybody we're an independent, we're not changing. And NBC's our network. So, you know, you, you can stop penciling us in to the ACC. Kevin Warren, former Domer, don't bother giving us a call. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's a message sender to me. The ACC has a grant of rights until 2036. Do I think there's a couple of ACC schools, looking at you, Virginia, that would love to come to the Big Ten? I do. But the problem is you can't just take one or two schools from the ACC because they can't fight that grant and rights contract by themselves. You, you need to take, like... You need a few schools to to leave the ACC so that the league's net then future is threatened and you can get out of that grant of rights deal that takes you into the 2030s or something, I think it is, okay? So if you're the Big Ten, the issue you have, and you've got a couple of other AAU schools out of the Big 12, Iowa State, Iowa State right now per capita has one of the most rabid fan bases in the country. Yep. The problem is we had to use the phrase per capita, okay? It's still small, by and large, what we see elsewhere in the Big Ten. I believe if we brought, I mean, Iowa State, I think, was 41st in athletic department revenue in 2019. You can't use any 2020 numbers because of COVID, right? So in 2019, the, the, the school year ending in 2019, I think Iowa State was 40th. That's really good. That'd be dead last in the Big Ten, okay? Um, and now, Kansas is like 21st or something. They, they rank ahead of several Big Ten schools in revenue. They bring, you know, AU membership as well. Um, and, of course an all-time elite-level basketball program. that You know what? When you start talking about divvying up NCAA tournament money and the, more, the higher you go, the more money you get, right. that, that, makes a, that makes a difference, right? The problem is the football program is maybe the worst Power 5, Power Conference football program we have seen since the Denny, Green, Francis P. Northwestern term, teams of the early 80s. So... If you're the Big Ten, there's not an obvious play that you can make today. Okay, so you bring Kansas in. I still think you can make an argument to bring Kansas in, even with what I said about their football team. But you can't bring them in as your 15th, right? Who's your 16th? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's not a natural dance partner to bring in with Kansas, like there was to bring in with Maryland, Rutgers, or Rutgers with Maryland, okay? So if you're the Big Ten, you're in this no man's land where you know you must do something to check the SEC, but there's not a move you can make tomorrow that you prob- that, that's probably achievable that, that makes everybody happy. It both is financially beneficial. You know, for example, Kansas brings in more athletic department revenue than Maryland does. All right. So something that's both financially beneficial and academically beneficial at the same time. So what would be the, what would be the best scenario if you're the Big Ten? If you don't have to make a move at all. Just stay with your same 14 teams. And instead what happens is your traditional cousin, they're not really brothers, cousins, close cousins. Is that fair? Yep. Your traditional close cousin out there out West strengthens themselves by absorbing the eight teams in the Big 12 to move their league into the central time zone for more lucrative commercial avails, more lucrative TV slots. You and your new Pac-20 buddy just say, hey, we're going, we're doing business exclusively with Fox. ESPN is now clearly not just the SEC's partner. They're the partner, if you know, like in a domestic sense, mm-hmm. if you know what I'm saying, right? So uh, you guys have consummated that union. So we've got our own thing like we do in the old, like we did in the old days. And that way we say to the SEC, hey, if you guys want to believe you run college football, we'll just go back to doing what we did for 80 years. We'll just play our seasons and the the champions go to the Rose Bowl and play each other because the Rose Bowl would love that. The Rose Bowl doesn't want to give up five o'clock on New Year's Day, ever. The new playoff format is going to demand that they do if they if they choose it. So this gives you leverage in that if you want a true national sport, you cannot just run us over like what you did with Oklahoma and Texas. And and this this was also the utilization of the Rose Bowl and the alliance with the Pac-10 at the time is how Jim Delaney successfully fended off a lot of SEC attempted power grabs in the past. So to me, if I'm a big if I'm in the Big Ten offices right now, 
I'm rooting like hell, like my former athletic director from my own conference, Bob Bowles, being now the commissioner of the Big 12, can make this deal happen because we don't have to take a risk by taking a team that we can say day one raises our ceiling Mm -hmm. because that team probably doesn't exist. But on the other hand, a clear move was made that checks the SEC's power base, and it comes from one of your allies at the exact same time. So an ally is strengthened athletically you didn't have to take a gamble and you've kind of you know stymied the the sec's uh attempt to uh you know create hegemony at the same time i think that's the best case scenario for the big Ten is to be rooting for uh is it Cle- george Klyavikov, i think is the uh, new pac-12 commissioner who just came right out and said at their media days guys i'm a businessman and i'm here to improve our network and our football uh, uh, league i mean he just flat out said that okay so if you hope that George and your old buddy Bob get together, they consummate a relationship, and now your primary partner in this sport is greatly strengthened, and so you guys can put up a united front against the SEC because you have the ultimate leverage, which is if you try to F with us, we'll just go back to regionalization. We'll play for the Rose Bowl. We'll make huge money, huge bank. Maybe our league can one year produce a national champion that splits it, but that would always put doubt on your process. You no longer control us. If I'm the Big Ten, that's what I would want to happen more than anything. Agreed. This is this is all going to be a leverage game, and the Rose Bowl is that leverage, especially when it comes to, obviously, the Big Ten and the Pac-12. Because if they decide someday uh, the SEC has is too close to hegemony here within the college football world, you can literally take your ball and go home and play, uh, play another. And they can't say that they're a national champion anymore uh, because they're not actually playing a national game. I also think it would behoove the Big Ten to do a scheduling alliance or maybe moving to, to eight conference games and then doing yeah. half of your non-conference games against the, the Pac-12. Yes. I think yes. that would very much strengthen both of those I things. Completely, especially with this new alliance. And then it's a US, you and the Pac-12, or Pac-20 now, you, can set, you essentially control college football, uh, say, uh, what? Um, west of the Missouri. West of the Missouri. Yeah, I mean, that's... That is except for Iowa State. That that is well, Iowa State would be in your new Pac-20. Yep. So, I mean, to me, that's the best option for the Big Ten. I'm getting the result that I want, but I don't have to take the gamble of addition that may not work out for me as I had hoped in the future. So, good question. All right, that'll do it for this week's episode of Bigger Ten. Uh, we'll be back at it again next week right here on this channel. Remember to like, rate, subscribe, follow, five-star review, whichever is the case and permitted on your platform that you access access us from each and every week. We would greatly appreciate that. It helps to continue this show and this channel to grow. You can also follow us on Twitter uh, at Bigger Ten. Earlier today, Dennis Dodd of CBS Sports noted the competitive advantage many Pac-12 teams have by reaching at least 80% vaccination. So they have what he described as, quote, roster certainty. Apparently, Dennis Dodd has never heard the name John Rahm. Uh, but uh, you can get a lot of takes like that. Uh, <laughs> and he deleted that tweet, by the did way. Did he? Good. Oh, no, well, I guess he didn't delete that tweet. He deleted some tweets around that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, tell that to John Rom, Denny. Yeah. Okay. But um, you keep up to date on what we think in between episodes all week long at Bigger Ten on Twitter. For Aaron McIntyre, I'm Steve Dace. We'll see you next time right here on Bigger Ten.